for Pentecost Sunday. It's found in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 21. The theme this morning is that God calls us to real living. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, it will be, in the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smokiness. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon of blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Please pray with me. Lord, I ask in your name this morning that you take this ancient text, you take your word this morning, and you knit it into our hearts and you give us good news about what this means for us today. Change us, Lord, where we need to be changed. Help us to set our sails to catch the wind of your spirit. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You know, I've said this before. But whenever you see the last days in the Bible, it means one thing, from now on, from now on. When you hear last days, it means from now on. We study in the story about God's original vision was to hang out with Adam and Eve. That's all he wanted to do. Just wanted to fellowship with them. And we learned that Adam and Eve sinned and then they hide from God. After Jesus ascended into heaven, he told his disciples, wait in the city. And that's exactly what they're doing. Wait. They're waiting. And as they're waiting, God shows up and blesses them in ways beyond what you can ask or even think. There's a hole in our heart that only the Holy Spirit can fill. There's a hole in our heart that only Jesus can fill. This week, I read a book by, uh, I had on my book shelf for a while, by John Eldridge. A book on men's spirituality. He wrote a book called Wild at Heart. And it's called Walking with God. And then the subtitle was simply this. Talk to God. Hear from God. Really. Talk. 
talk to God. Hear from God. Really. And what we're reading this morning in this text is this is a restoration of the relationship that God wanted all along with Adam and Eve. It's a restoration of that relationship. It's a restoration of the Tower of Babel. Remember when they all were confused and they started speaking in different languages? Now here at Pentecost, God is saying through my Son, Jesus Christ, you can start to speak a common language with one another. It's the language of love. Just as I have loved you, so you also should love one another. Many years ago, uh, Glenn Needs and uh, two, of, two of my kids, we, we went down to Ocean Grove. It was a May day like this, only much colder, but it was damp like this, and we were in the Ocean Grove Auditorium, and it was freezing in there. And uh, we heard a guy, his name was Keith Elias. He was from the New York Giants. And what was amazing about Keith Elias was he was so small. He was not a big guy. He must have weighed like maybe 175 soaking wet. But he was fast. And he had been a wide receiver. I think he had been a wide receiver for the Giants. And uh, he was there giving his testimony to the mm -hmm. men that day. And he was a successful pro football player. He had more money than he knew what to do with. He had any date he wanted to have. He was on the top of the world. And on the top of the world, he went to the Lord and said, Is this all there is? In that day he testified because the Holy Spirit answered him back. Heck no. I've got a lot more than this for you. British newspaper columnist Bernard Levin in his column wrote this. Uh, some newspaper columnist in England. I find it quite descriptive of our situation. Countries like ours. He's talking about countries like Britain and America are full of people who have all the material comforts they desire, together with even such non-material blessings as a happy family, and yet they lead lives of quiet desperation, understanding nothing but the fact that there's a hole inside of them, that however much food and drink they pour into it, however much stuff and how many big screen televisions they have, However many well-balanced children and loyal friends they parade around the edges of, that hole in their heart still aches. Deepak Chopra, one of the, you know, New Age people, New Age wisdom, says there seems to be a hole in the middle of everyday life as if a rock had been thrown through a plate glass window. But instead of a physical hole, one could call this a meaning. This morning, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he said to his disciples, and he said to us, I'm, I may be physically gone, but I'm here with my Holy Spirit to fill your lives. The Holy Spirit comes to us and helps make sense of our lives and to understand God's purpose for us. The Holy Spirit comes to us and helps make sense of our lives and to understand God's purpose for us. You know, it's interesting that we make such a big deal out of the second chapter of Acts. But it's interesting that the Holy Spirit does not come again this way in all of the Bible. That this one signature expression of the Holy Spirit, it happens in Acts 2. And then we talk about the Holy Spirit coming in other parts of the Bible, but it's not like this. Which tells me that the Holy Spirit comes to us in signature moments 
in each of us in, in very, very special ways. To a man like Keith Elias, he's on the top of the mountain, on the top of the world, and he just has one question to God. Is this all there is? And he hears the Spirit of God say to him, Heck, no. I have more for you. And this text tells me that God has a way of reaching out to each of us uniquely in our hearts, in our homes, and in the body of Christ. <laughs> What's required if we want God's purpose in God's passion in our lives, it's to have the courage to be patient and to really wait on God. An active waiting. An active waiting. Active waiting has a lot of expressions. I think, I believe that active waiting is really cool when we say to God, you've got to help me. I don't see how I'm going to be able to do this. I need your help. When we confess our powerlessness, when we say to God, I can't, and we read in his word that God can, and that he'll help us if we believe. What is God's word to us in any situation we face? Romans 8, 16. The Spirit of God testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God. And fellow heirs with Jesus Christ. If it's in here, it's for you. And it's for me. If it's in here, it's for you. And it's for me. And it's God saying to us, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going to come to you. I'm going to come to you. And we could scream out with an explanation this morning that we are adopted. We've been adopted into God's family. The Holy Spirit comes to us and helps make sense of our lives and to understand God's purpose for us. That we are children of God. I'm not sure I connected the dots last week. I talked about being over at the ball field, the memorial field, and how at 10, 15 at night, God mercifully turned on the sprinklers at the stadium and ended a, ended a baseball game that was going on forever. <laughs> what I may have forgotten to tell you, it was a God moment, but that shortly before at that baseball field, I felt like, you know, sometimes God speaks to you when, you when you just give Him time to speak to you. When you're not, you know, I got to do this, I got to do that, I got to do this, I got to do that. And I felt like the Lord said to me at the memorial field that you're in me, John. That that is who you are. That's your identity. You're in me. That I'm a child of God. That I'm in Jesus Christ. And then what do you know it? This week, I, I open up a book by the, the man who, who brought to us the story, Randy Frazee. And in this book, he talked about positional identity. Positional identity. And it was like he gave a theological word to what God told me on that ball field. That positional identity is that you and I, when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, are in Jesus Christ. We're in Him. And as a great preacher once said, there's no bigger name I can drop than the name of Jesus Christ. You know, I, I probably couldn't get five minutes with the President of the United States, but I can get all the time I want. Positional identity. That we're in Christ. We're children of God. And if children, then heirs. Big inheritance has been dropped at our doorstep. And that when we're his children, and when we're walking with him, 
The Holy Spirit will give us the power to accomplish what God calls us to accomplish. Like electricity in the air. Like electricity in the air. I heard a police detective give a testimony this week. This is a police detective in Cleveland. This guy's seen everything. Okay, he's been on a lot of calls. He's been to a lot of homicides. He said when he went into that house where those three women had been locked up, he said, is he, this is a, a real tough police officer, a detective, he's seen it all. He said as he went up those stairs, he could feel evil. In my ministry, there's something they, well, it doesn't even matter where. I, I knew what he was talking about. Okay? There have been a couple of places where I, when I walked in, you could just, ooh, you could like hear the oboe playing. You know, you could hear the oboe playing in the background. You know something? The devil is real. God is realer. God is more real. And there's an electricity in the air for our heart, for our homes, and for the body of Christ. The Methodist Church, we're, we're simply a renewal movement in the body of Christ. And when John Wesley said, when it stops being that, he said he hoped it would die. He really said that. <clears throat> One of my first DSs said that. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to accomplish what God calls us to accomplish. There's an electricity in the air of God. And this afternoon or tomorrow morning, or wherever you find yourself. And when we find ourselves, especially a couple fries short of a happy meal, okay? That's where God is. You gotta help me, Lord. You realize how long he's been waiting for you to say that? I need your help. I need your help. I can't do this without you. And I confess to you, I'm most dangerous when I think I know where I'm going. <laughs> People who love it went shaking their head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One time, this is a story way out of my past. My best buddy, my best buddy Ed. His, uh, his, his little sister was sick and his mother was student teaching at, uh, at, at South Freehold Hospital. And I said, I know right where that hospital is. I'll take you to it. I took him to Paul Kimball Hospital in Lakewood, which is about 20 miles away from South Freehold Hospital. They were taking his mother in Paul Kimball Hospital. We were not even in the right place. You know, I went to 911 eight days or so after it happened. And I went there faithfully, and uh, I spent a day there, and I never saw so many people doing nothing, not knowing what to do in my life. Because there was just this little area where they could work, and there was just this peri perimeter of hundreds of people begging for something to do. And, and I felt like the Lord said to me, go to home to Cinnamon, and that's my work for you. When I went to Israel, okay, I felt like the Lord say to me, I got an altar for you back in St. Vincent. I'm glad you're here, but go back home. The Holy Spirit gives us the power, what God gives us the power to accomplish what God calls us to accomplish. Corey Tenbrook, she was uh, surviving a Nazi concentration camp. One time she had a had a glove in her hand. It wasn't on her, wasn't she, you know, it was just flat on her hand. It wasn't on her fingers. And she said, we are like this glove. This glove is worthless until a hand goes inside of it. And you and I are like this glove. And we want the hand of God to fill our lives. To fill
fill our lives and to make a difference. The Holy Spirit helps us understand God's purpose for us for children of God. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to accomplish what God calls us to accomplish. The Holy Spirit helps us become all that God has created us to be. In the story, one of the closing chapters, it asks this question. Have you allowed God to reveal who you really are? And you know when you'll find out who you really are in a crisis? The book of Proverbs says this. If you're weak in a crisis, you're weak indeed. In other words, that when the things that challenge us show up, that's when you and I, when we need God. A speaker, uh, he was talking about size transitions in local churches. Uh, and uh, he said something that really caught my attention. And he, he said, uh, this is stressful stuff. He said, we're, we're talking about nervous breakdown stuff. I mean, this guy has published books. He said, I've had three nervous breakdowns, two <coughs> metaphorically. You know, I'm like, okay, you got my attention here. Recently, you know, I said, we're most dangerous where we know where I'm going, where we think we know where we're going. I recently, I can't remember the exact spot, but I, I thought I knew where I was going, but I said to the person, I, I think I know where I'm going. Is this where it is? And they clarified it for me. Because the Bible says, there is wisdom in a multitude of counselors. There is wisdom. That's fellowship. That's fellowship. You know, there's the story of the six blind men there's a story of the six blind men who, uh, who, who went to look at an elephant. And the first blind man <coughs> grabbed the leg, said an elephant is like a pillar. The second blind man took the tail, said an elephant is like a rope. The third blind man grabbed the trunk, said oh, it's just like a tree branch. The fourth blind man grabbed an ear, said it was all, oh, it's like a hand fan. The fourth, or the fifth blind man touched the belly, said an elephant is like a wall. The fifth, or the sixth blind man touched the tusk, said uh, an elephant is like a solid pipe. They were all right, but they needed each other to understand what an elephant was really like. You know, I know we're not all blind, but eh, maybe we are a little bit. There are four Gospels where four different people needed to share how they experienced our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Positional identity. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Because I'm in Christ, I am altogether a new creation. The old is gone. The fresh and new has come. I pray this morning that each of us pray for the Holy Spirit. You know, we sing the song, While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. I pray this morning that we pray for a new manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Talk to God. Hear from God. Really. Talk to God. Hear from God. Really. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. God calls us to a patience, an active waiting. I really need you, Lord. I got 20 years left. I got two days left. I got two years left. You and I don't know. But how are you going to spend them? And your relationship with God is the biggest thing you've got going. That is the biggest thing you got going right now. And when we have that patience, when we say to God, I'm waiting on you, I need you, He will give you His purpose and His passion like never before. Let's pray. God, we love you. Just, Lord, I'm just trying to get us on base this morning with you. I'm just, I'm just asking your name this morning. That.
the Holy Spirit would be front and center in our lives. Where we could talk to you. Where we can hear from you. Really. Really. Give us a patience that's active. May we know your purpose and your passion for us. Right on this corner, Lord, and wherever you place us, it's in your name we pray. Help us, Lord, to connect to the electricity. It's in your name we pray. Amen. While on others that were calling, do not pass us by.